Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to IMS Day 2. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, the proms are an annual series of orchestral concerts that happen in London. They've been happening since 1895. Uh, last year, after 120 years, they finally let dance music through the doors to the Royal Albert Hall. And uh, courtesy of these two chaps. And this is what happened. And so it continued for 
24 tracks, 90 minutes, and this, as of this morning, 636,000 views on BBC iPlayer. My name's Craig McLean, I'm a journalist. Pete Tong, you know, he was the man on the decks. Joe's Buckley is a former trumpet player who has turned his life around and uh, was the man uh, in charge of the orchestra here. Uh, this started last year. It's now rolling out uh, around the world. There's shows booked for London's O2, 15,000 tickets sold in one day, and there are even bigger plans for next year. Pete, how did this uh, fantastic symphonic electronic dance music idea begin? Um, we were, I mean, the proms have approached Radio 1 a few times to, to get involved and put something on. Um, when they called at the beginning of last year, they, it was kind of open discussion of, you know, would, would you like to come up with something? And then we talked about it internally at Radio 1. We, was, we were about to celebrate um, coming to this island for 20 years, um, so it was quite a big deal. And then in the kind of programming and think, thought process of how we were going to celebrate 20 years of being in Ibiza, um, someone came up with a bright idea of like, what about doing a prom based around classic Ibiza tunes? So um, that, that was the inception, being, being invited, basically. Jules, you've been taking orchestras into clubs for some time now. Can you tell us about why you initially wanted to do that, being a classically educated musician? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. I think when I was at college in London studying, um, I eventually studied composition as a degree, and there weren't that many opportunities to get my music performed by large orchestras. I think it was half an hour they gave you in four years. And I had a lot of like-minded musicians who were into the same stuff as me, who liked to go club and who listened to a lot of non-classical music. So we um, decided to put together an orchestra and just drop it into a club in Shoreditch in London and see what happened. So I set that up with a, a colleague of mine, Chris Wheeler. We basically knocked heads about how to do it, pigeonholed everybody, basically my drinking mates, see who's up for you know, getting together and then we crashed into cargo. And I think we, yeah, we played like some Four Hero stuff and some Isaac Hayes and some original tunes and basically it, we realized that, w that there was a good vibe there. And, and it was uh, breaking with the sort of formalities that everybody associates with, class with orchestras. Pete, when you approached the idea, were you at all worried that the you know, rather august, sophisticated, you might say stuck up world of classical music, would just, it just wouldn't mesh with your world? I thought about it. I, mean, I, would, it, I wouldn't say we became preoccupied about it because we were invited and, and they kind of, I guess they must have half ex you know, knew what they were gonna get. Um, so no, not, not really. I mean, obviously um, string playing in, and orchestrating in particular has always been so synonymous, synonymous with um, the kind of history of house music and techno. I mean, and I think at the core of our idea was, wouldn't it be amazing to, you know, people use cheap synthesizers in Chicago and Detroit because that's all they had. Um, and, and they couldn't afford an orchestra with 65 players. So, and I'm sure if, you know, some of them wouldn't have used an orchestra back in the day, but if it was a lot easier, like it was in the days of disco, maybe we would have had some of those house and techno, techno classics with real string sections on. Um, so just, just going back and reinterpreting you know, these amazing tunes like Strings of Life um, really appealed to me and, uh, and appealed to Jules. So that was, and, and then trance music in particular, which resonated so strongly in the 90s. Um, and I think, again, when you, th you know, instantly think back of Ibiza classics from the formative times in the 90s, um, then a lot of those tunes lend, them, lend themselves to classical arrangements as well. So, Jules, you know, you're a man who's just won a, a Grammy Award uh, for Contemporary Instrumental Album. Nonetheless, this man presented you with a, a long list of 77 deep cuts <laughs> yeah. from 20 years of Ibiza, which is a tall order for anyone to try and wrestle down into a set. Yeah, I mean, the what, Proms has been running since 1895. It probably would have taken about 100 years to get our original list 
written out, but uh, sorry, I, I cut you off. So this long list of 77, I mean, what was the criteria you were looking for? And which, which ones could you put, what kind of tunes could you put aside and say, this won't work? And which ones could you keep and say, yes, this has got potential? Yeah, it's a good question. I think um, we, originally the, the list came through from Pete, and then we sat down, Chris and I, and we listened through every single track. And we're basically trying to, to find within ourselves where would be the most inspiration for us to write and to put it together and also for the listeners and for the audience on that experience. And I think obviously some tracks like Lola's theme, originally it was a 70s disco track. So that was straight in there. You know, we knew we could make that sound massive, but then we also wanted to really challenge ourselves for this concept and to take some tracks which were much more difficult to um, to realize in this way and we wanted to make sure that we had uh, the best of both worlds so it wasn't like we were just taking the easiest most obvious tracks it was trying to find interest and new things at the same time Pete what was a what were the you know cornerstone tracks for you that had to be in there if at all possible by any means necessary um I don't know, it's funny, I, ask a DJ to list their favorite records and basically foam starts coming out of your ears because you can never, you know, every day you think about it, you're gonna come up with a different list. So that's, that's partly why it ended up being such a long list of 77 tunes. And I, I opened it up, we had a debate internally at Radio One as well, so I let every, welcomed everybody to, to make their suggestions as well. Um, I think there was, you know, a bit like when I prepare a set, you think of bookends, you know, I, and funny enough, there was a guy at Radio One who was very hands-on in this process as well, um, who's subsequently left to go to Spotify, George Ogatudis, and he had a big thing with me about the, the first tune, the first tune had to be um, right. Club to Death, wasn't it? Yeah, Club to Death, yeah. Um, the, Rob, the, Rob, tr the track from Trainspotting. And when you actually broke down that as a piece of music, the chords, are very, very similar to right here, right now. And I always wanted to go with right here, right now. So um, I won that battle. <laughs> but, um, you know, there, there was, right until the end, there was, you know, we, would, we were going to do Born Slippy. That was gonna be our big ending. And I tried to get um, Carl to come and perform it. That was gonna be one of our like trump card surprises. And he, went a long way, you know, for, for, for a month or so, it was all gonna be cool, but he kind of changed his mind at the last minute and didn't want to perform without Rick. And it was too late for us to um, change the setup to kind of have the whole band set up there. So we were left without our ending tune um, quite late in the day. And Insomnia only came about because of Born Slippy not being in there. And Insomnia turns out to be probably the most replayed part of the, of the um, on the iPlayer. Um, and the re only reason that tune wasn't in there at the beginning is because Faithless were closing the Radio One Weekend live from Ibiza um, on the Sunday, so. So, Jules, once you had a, a tight list of songs that you were gonna play, what was the creative process for you? Did you have to get stems from the original artists? Yeah, so the, the process, effectively, the starting point was the, the list, then the next discussion was which mix versions are we gonna do? Um, and then I would say for the majority, if not all of them, bar one track. In fact, no, there weren't stems for any of the tracks, so we just transcribe it off the record, get together with the band, get together with Chris, break it down into its parts, and make sure that we're either representing it to the best level we can find or reinterpreting it in a fresh way. And the funny thing is about Insomnia is that we had two days rehearsal, and we only realized at the end of the first day that Cole wasn't gonna do it. So uh, Matt, the guitar player, did a quick takedown of the, the skeletal structure of Insomnia, and then I wrote the arrangement in the coffee break the next day, and then we threw it on the stands and... I actually, I called Sister Bliss, and she, fortunately she was really into the idea and very positive about us doing it, got very excited, did, did send the stems over really efficiently, but then when he took a listen to them, <laughs> it, it yeah, wasn't that, working, was it? Yeah, we could only take one sentence from it. Luckily it was, I can't get no sleep. <laughs> so. no, I think, um, I think I, the other thing that was really important that I wanted to do with the Ibiza thing in mind is we wanted the highs and the lows, so I think 
one of the things that really pleased me is that the down moments of, in the performance are just as significant as the highs. So I think doing Smoke Belch, I was really proud of that because that's kind of, I mean, it is a classic tune, but it's not a kind of hit, hit, hit tune. So and I think that was one of the best moments as well. Was there ever a moment where, in a nod to the classical history of the proms, where you thought, we need to get a classical piece in here, somewhere in the mix? Yeah, I suggested one. I thought it was a no-brainer to do um, Adagio for strings, Barber's Adagio for strings. And, um, That's the piece from the film Platoon, the Vietnam film, where everybody gets killed. So, no, it wasn't. It was written by Tiesto. Down our moment. <laughs> I mean, I can I honestly... Tiesto wrote it. <laughs> No, but I, I sent that to him. Um, that was right there from the beginning. And interestingly, I mean, the interesting part of the process, because they're all professionals and he, he can write and read music, is that we never, I, w I was always asking for demos and we'd never get a demo because he, he'd, he'd call me up and say it would sound so Mickey Mouse because it's going to be a load of clicks. So we didn't really get to hear, I didn't get to hear the interpretations of what were in his head and the players obviously knew until literally the day before. Um, but they, he did, well, you told a story about why we didn't end up doing a classical piece. Yeah, I think um, what we didn't want to do with this project and this concept was make it a kind of a, a supposed crossover thing. Because it's not, I don't even think that that word exists in music. It's just good music or bad music. And we didn't want the punters and the journalists and everybody who was um, looking at this gig to just focus on this one classical piece and kind of make a comparison. And it's one of the most well-known string orchestra pieces ever played. It's been played a billion times. And I just felt we had better highs and better lows in the set. That was a good answer to your classical question at the beginning, because that is, that's kind of what he's saying, that actually us playing classical music at the proms might have not been as appropriate. Yeah, it's, maybe it's a bit naff, yeah. you know. Uh, speaking of naff, there was one track you kind of dug your heels in on initially, didn't want to play it because <laughs> it, it, remind, it reminded you what, of a, some bad teenage experiences, Raven, which, which was that? Uh, it was children. <laughs> yeah. Poor Robert Miles. Why, uh, why, why didn't you here. want it in there and why did you want it in there? I think, um, I was having a moment, a flashback of some serious teenage angst, <laughs> of which children seem to be momentously linked. So I gently asked Pete whether, like, do we, you know, do we really need to do children? Because I was never really into it when I was at school, and then Pete shut me down pretty fast, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a guilty pleasure. I think. Um, I mean, part of it. I mean, interestingly, when that record first came out, there was a big gang war amongst the labels to try and sign it. And it was cool for like five minutes of its life or 15 at the beginning. Um, no, I, I just thought thematically um, it was gonna be such a strong thing. And it, it kind of again synonymous with sunsets and Ibiza and the Mambo and the fact that Robert actually lives in Ibiza now and he's, he's actually part of this conference on a regular basis, so. I'm sorry, Robert. I don't know if he's usually outside. I mean, talking of labels, Pete, you know, you had experience of working with orchestras with, with Goldie. How was it back then when you were introducing that idea of the orchestras into drum and bass at the time? Was there a lot of resistance from the community? It was a resistance from me, that's for sure, because it was so expensive. Um, <laughs> I, th I thought he was completely mad. Um, he came in my office the first time I ever met him and with his pit bull dog and a um, very intimidating manager and um, there was a, someone else in the company who was meant to see him before me, but he knew Goldie, so he said, no, I'm not doing that meeting, you should do it. And then, um, yeah, he played me Timeless, um, which is obviously an incredibly ambitious piece of music, 20 odd minutes long, and I, w I couldn't look up the phone, it was before mobile phones, really. Um, and uh, no, I just, you know, Goldie, Goldie had it all in his head, and he, he was, well, as, you got, as, I, as I got to know him, he's obsessed by jazz, actually, and Pat Metheny. And, and he had a healthy appreciation of classical music. So it was always part of his thing, you know, and he, on the first album, it was all done with him and Rob Playford in a, um, in a bedroom in Essex somewhere. And it sounded pretty damn good. Um, and then obviously when we tried to actually do it live, it was just a nightmare because, um, you know, he wanted, he wanted like a 20 piece orchestra on stage, I remember in Kilburn. 
And it was just, and it was a big fight because we didn't want to put up the money. Um, so he got his revenge on the second album. He made a 60 minute track called Mother and, and f got about 50 players down in some residential studio somewhere. And um, yeah, the rest is history. But he, he was the one eventually fulfilled his dream, what, 20 years later, and actually got to play the Timeless album at the Royal Festival Hall. And he, uh, yeah, he found Jules and Chris to do that with him. So when the suggestion came up um, of doing the proms at the beginning of last year, that was, it, was, it was kind of the only orchestra I knew, really. I didn't, I didn't actually know them, but I knew about them. So um, we were put together, like a blind date. <laughs> I mean, Jules, do you think this interest uh, in the classification of these, his music, is it a kind of demographic change? You know, we, there's talk of this idea of the lapsed raver or even the collapsed raver. But is this something for, you could see the audience there, they were, they were on their feet from the opening bars. Is there a sense that this is catering to an audience who might not want to go to clubs maybe at all anymore, but they're not going to give up on their music? Um, I think it goes to prove that the music, how much people love this music, for sure. And it goes to prove how large an audience there is for this music, this great music over such, over decades now, you know? But I think also it's probably fair to say we didn't really know what the reaction was going to be. It wasn't something we, we could have planned in advance. Um, it could have bombed. I think it just, it just resonated with people in a magical way. Um, I really wanted to make sure that it wasn't just a kind of old fest <laughs> of just reminiscing. That's why, I, kind of with my Radio 1 hat on, we insisted on interacting with contemporary acts, hence John Newman and Ella Eyre being involved. Because I felt that joined the dots between the current Radio 1 audience and obviously the, the historical um, dance fans that you loved those tunes and those tunes meant so much to. Um, and I think that was another really successful part of the show, having that access. And, and although it was dominated by, by the older audience, there was a lot of younger people in there as well. Um, and I think the word spread about what we'd done on the night much quicker through social media because of the, um, having the younger element involved as well. So I'd like to think going forward, we get a healthy mix of, of young and old kind of thing. It's more the, exciting to me that way. Um, you know. On the night itself, uh, and given that you're talking of, you are doing more shows, What's the, what's the communication between you two, like when you know, you're on the decks, you're conducting, how do, you, how do you two communicate and what do you have to do? Well, I guess we could probably, again, go back to insomnia as an example of the work that Pete and I did because we, we realized uh, as late as the dress rehearsal that we wanted to extend and shorten certain sections or at least make them more flexible. Um, and I think you know, with this music, you want to take the audience right up to the edge and then take them further and then further and then drop them over. And obviously, no one knows that better than Pete. So I, we basically put together a series of hand signals that would allow Pete to... <laughs> but he, we had, we had hand he, signals now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he had, we had a talkback thing as well, but it, it was down to the hand signals. And it was... It was a, it, it, I didn't realise we could do it until the dress rehearsal, but he said to me, you know, if you think it's going well and you don't want that tune to stop, then keep going. So, like, like in a DJ set, if, you, if, you're in, if you're in a moment, you want, want to keep looping the record or, or, or play it a second time or reinterpret it. So during Insomnia, um, we got really loopy. Okay. And... Uh, and then it, it kind of changed the atmosphere because I think it connected with the crowd straight away. It, it, and the players started looking over their shoulder at me, bitching about their fingers hurting. Yeah. But I think he was looking the other way at the audience, enjoying it so much. We, 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 we got into the loop very efficiently, but we kept it going probably a little bit too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Funny thing is, it also goes to show, I mean, if, if you were to talk about direct links, then the, the mesmeric element of dance music can be directly linked to the mesmeric quality of a lot of minimalist mm. classical music. And I think in, in this moment with Insomnia, for the orchestra, it, it was not something unusual. Like, they're cool with that and they want to do it. It's just, uh, I think it was more unusual for the people in the audience, you know. But I think a lot of people think that we were just playing along to the record as well. Um, yeah. But we, we really weren't. It was all, it was all live. 
apart from a tempo click. Right. I mean, you're obviously doing something right because other people are trying to do what you did so well. Hacienda did one, there's one here, some super clubs and some not so super clubs are trying to do their own versions. What makes your version, the original version, better? And you know, what do you feel about these other people who are doing similar? I don't think, I don't think we were, I think there was orchestras before playing house music, yeah, acid brass and a few other yeah, things, but. There's been like Jeff Mills or something. Yeah, and Jeff, Jeff has done stuff and the Swede, Swedes actually did something as well. But, um, well, I think just the scale of it and it's a good band a bit you know it's a very good band <laughs> he's got a very good orchestra yeah i think if if uh, as a statement on this question would be that with heritage orchestra with chris and myself and the guys and the band within it it has a core band who are specialized in in sequences in everything from loops to to finding sounds i think we want to go in on the music as deep as possible like to the deepest level and make the quality as high as possible and maybe that will stand the test of time against, uh, yeah. against other people. I, I mean, it's, it's great that we've inspired other people to do the same thing, if, if that's what it was that, that inspired them. I mean, it's, a, it's, um, it's flattering and it's great. It's, it's, a create, you know, it's all part of the creative mix and the creative process. But um, I think the other thing that really mattered is um, that the, some of the bands were either there on the night, like Orbital, or they reached out afterwards and they exactly what Jules just said, they were so appreciative of the depth in terms of the arrangement. They were asking, you know, afterwards, they want, you know, could we get the music back? <laughs> could we do, the, you know, and, um, yeah, because for something like Orbital, who I actually signed to my label years before, um, they, just, they just couldn't believe it. Paul, Paul, in particular, came, Hartnell, he just wanted to be on the floor at the Royal Albert Hall seeing Jules Buckley and the Royal Heritage Orchestra, the Heritage Orchestra playing his song it meant so much to him, so, um, and, it, it, and then, then you want to kind of live up to the, the, the process, so. So, as we've already mentioned, you know, you've sold out 15,000 tickets for the O2. 17. 17, sorry, 17,000 <laughs> tickets for the O2 in London for December in one day. Birmingham Arena goes on sale tomorrow. There's Manchester Arena as well. What's your ambitions for next year? Where are you going to go with this? I think get, get through these shows, I mean, We've got, kind of got up the ante in terms of the, um, the visual experience, the experience in the room. We just want to make sure we deliver the best, best, best possible show. We're going to put an awful lot of that ticket money back on the stage and back on, on the production in the rooms. And just do it to the best you can possibly do it. Um, and just see what kind of reaction we get. But we've had, you know, we've, we've already thought about or been approached by, um, places like the Greek Theatre or the Hollywood Bowl, um, Sydney Opera House were on, on pretty quickly, um, and some other kind of iconic locations around the world. I think that's, that's what appeals to me and Jules, is actually doing iconic places as well. Um, but it's an expensive thing to do, it's an expensive thing to move around, that's for sure. Um, so we, I think the first thing is just get those three shows, kind of just do them as good as we can possibly do them and see, see See what happens. I mean, the, the O2 is a big room and a, a 63-piece orchestra. You still need some production. Jules, you're kind of front and centre with it. You're the, you're the front man, if you like, because he's off to the side in the DJ booth. Can you bring any theatricality to your performance? Um, at this stage, I don't want to give away what I've got <laughs> planned. You talking but... stage diving? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen the stage diving conductor yet. I, th I think that, you know, if, even looking at the, um, the great video from, from the BBC there, I think that the, the culmination of this, like, mosaic-like production, everything that comes together, I think it should be... i tell you, one of the things on the night that we didn't account for, and I think one of the reasons it was so successful and it resonated in such a way and it went viral in the way it did, is because of the crowd. The crowd were, um, from that hand, hand clap break on right here, right now, just took the thing to another level halfway through the first song. It kind of lifted the orchestra, it lift, lifts everyone, and then um, it became kind of one thing. Um, and the, the director of the proms kind of popped up behind me about halfway through. He was just like looking around. He said he's never seen, I mean, I grew up watching, the only prom I ever really watched was the last night at the proms, and you see the flags, and I remember that like childhood image. 
but he was saying to me he's never seen the Albert Hall like that, even on the last night of the proms. So all, all around us, behind me, um, everyone was standing up, going crazy pretty quickly. So I think that's something else that we've got to make sure works at the O2, um, that the crowd are very much part of it. Is there an album in this project? I think so, sure. Yep. Yeah, we're, th we're talking about that. <laughs> and, and would it be with similar criteria? What would work well in a room is going to work well on records? Yeah, I think there's, um, you know, we could change the set. We, 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 had, we, we, had, we had a list of 77. He started working on a lot of them, so we could change the set. But I think that there is a demand and an expectation um, to relive those, those moments that, that worked at the prom. I mean, the most common thing I read on social media in the weeks that followed was, I can't believe I missed it. I can't believe I didn't know about it. So I think there's a lot of people coming to those shows that actually just want to see what we did. Almost would be happy if we did the same thing again. And I think it will, that would go with the recording as well. But with, with his genius and his, his players, we'd, we'd try and go, as he said, as deep as possible and add something, maybe, that rather than just complete copy. Yeah, because there were some tracks within the set where we we completely remixed it, right? Yeah. The... I mean, where LA Air was just couldn't, but she was just blown away because I, we wanted to do Waiting All Night as a, as a sunset tune and make it Ibiza centric because it was, well, you know, it's very contemporary, very new. It didn't really have an Ibiza history as such, but doing it as a sunset tune, I mean, she, she was just like so thrilled um, that, 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 we, that we'd done that. So, yeah. and she I think those are the ones that you want to record then. Yeah. But because yeah. that was a little bit like, almost like Radio 1 Live Lounge, I guess, but doing it with a huge orchestra. Yeah. Just before we throw it onto the floor for a few questions and finish with another tune, Jules, finally for you, which of your players had it toughest on the nights? Strings guys, glockenspiel, whose, whose fingers were bleeding the most? Um, well, to be honest, when we did Insomnia, uh, we looped it for about, f I don't know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes, and the trumpets in the rear, in the coffee break I didn't have much time so I kind of I actually just we rehearsed it with the strings and I orally told the brass okay you're gonna play a B flat you're gonna play a C sharp etc etc and they were looping these top uh, B naturals for about 15 minutes and the uh, my trumpet player he's a world class but at the end he came up to me and he said we had to do it for you we had to do it for you, Jules. And he's, you know, I think I almost ended his career in that moment. Brilliant, poor Trump player. Okie doke, does anyone uh, have any questions from the floor? No, great, we can go. We can go. Shy. Oh, there's, there's one, one there. at the front, sorry. Gentleman in the red T-shirt. Hi, my name is Agostino Carollo, and I would like to know how much did it cost to, to produce the event? Um, well, it's kind of hidden in the, in the, it's very hard to put price on it because it was part of um, the overall proms production. So um, we got a lot of stuff that you probably wouldn't normally get, you know, just having the room and having the, all the television production, everything else to go with it. But um, it's expensive. <laughs> It was so expensive the that they couldn't rehearse. It's taken rehearse us a long time to work out how to do it, you know, because, well, just even if you think about what does one member of the orchestra get on a scale, you know, everyone, everyone's getting, you know, 500 pound here, five, you know. It's all union driven as well because so every rehearsal when you're dealing with orchestra players, um, so that's one of the reasons it's taken so long to actually get it back up to actually do it. It's, it's, eight, it's going to be 18 months by the time we walk on at the O2. Yeah, because we had, we had two days rehearsal uh, and that was it. So we basically yeah. spent six months planning it, but we, did, we rehearsed it in two days yeah. and then did the gig. And it kind of has to be done on that scale to make it work. You know, you couldn't, we couldn't really, it'd be difficult to do the Albert Hall again, um, just with selling 5,000 tickets for one night. And that's where the being part of the whole proms and being part of the proms production, we were able to do it in that way. But to actually go back out and do it again, it had to be somewhere like the O2 to make it make sense. And then we didn't know what the demand would be like, so. Anyone else? A chap in the front here with a white T-shirt. 
Just shout. Did he think um, it, yes, he thinks it would work here? We talked, yeah, I think it would work here for sure. Um, and I think we were talking backstage straight away after the show. There was two places that immediately got mentioned. One was Glastonbury and the other was um, Dort Villa. But again, it's, it's economically it didn't work to do it here. Um, you know, just flying 65 people over here. Um, even, and even if you could pick up a local band, you still got your core band. And then um, you can only get about 2,500, 3,000 people up there. So, you know, hopefully one day we'll find out and get a nice sponsor. <laughs> Anyone's out there. Anyone else? Okay, do you want to hear another tune before we go? Yes, a bit please. of it. <laughs> okay, um, is it Insomnia you've got there? Yeah, I think it's insomnia. Okay, so this is the close. You've seen the start. This is the end of uh, a very heavily, heavily trafficked iPlayer uh, concert. If you've got access to iPlayer, I would recommend watching this. Or in fact, it's on YouTube even, I think, as well. But the whole concert is worth digging into. You'll be on your feet. Anyway, Jules and Pete, this is uh, insomnia. Thank you very much, chaps. <laughs> It's not insomnia. Yeah, I know.